Oh, oh, oh. Hey, and we are. Oh, I muted you too. Hold on. Hey, and I can Sorry. talk again. Yeah. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome. I think we're going to have some more people joining us in a moment. But yeah, we're doing things slightly differently today to last time um, and it's going to be fun. Basically, if you're new here, welcome, welcome. These are our group chats where we all get together and talk interesting stuff about contact. It's always very interesting. Today we're going to do something slightly differently where we're going to have kind of a topic that we'll introduce and then Robert is going to uh, kind of lead the discussion a little bit with some of his thoughts about this topic, and then we're gonna open it up to questions and personal interpretation. Um, so I'm just gonna dive straight in and kind of introduce what's going on, and then I'm gonna throw across to him. Today we wanna talk about approaches and expression in contact. This is like, what lens do we see contact through? What is it that um, kind of influences us and encourages us like makes us makes our contact our own um and yeah there's lots of everyone comes from this from different angles and there's debates that go on back and forth we we have these kind of debates of technical or sports juggling versus flow or flow arts and we have these discussions of is it better to be very concentrated and structured in our approach or do we want to be a bit more random and chaotic um, and how do we find a balance here? And how do we, how do we let things influence us without just copying and things like that? Um, we'll touch on some of this. And for people in the chat now, I'd be really interested to know what your own approaches are. If you're just a starter, like if you're just a beginner, like what are your influences? Um, if you're more experienced, what is it that kind of drives you? And um, what approaches do you take? To creating new stuff or creating your own style. So um, if you're kind of thinking on that, and then we're going to go and throw that stuff around. Um, but for now, um, I'd like to throw across to Robert, if we could unmute Robert there. Because he's still... Oh, Hello yeah. there. Hello. Um, so I'm Robert. Um, and yeah, kind of like uh, going into it, just want to go with a little bit of uh, of sort of like a introduction or like a background. So I want to talk about not contact juggling, but I want to talk about a bit of our art history for especially, and we're talking about European Western approaches where we have these periods where we first say like everything is classical art and then we start having expressionism. So when we talk about classical arts, we, talk about a very realistic depiction of a subject. Um, and that's uh, eventually like th that takes a very long time. Eventually sort of 1800s photo cameras got invented. And at the same time, expressionism also also came. And with expressionism, it didn't really matter to and this is a really gross generalization, like my art history teacher will not like me talking about it like this. But expressionism, when it came, it became not about having a realistic interpretation of the subject, but more of like, what does this subject make me feel like? Or uh, how do I experience this? How do I observe a certain thing? Um, so just so we have divine uh, expressionism. Now, uh, yeah, that not having to need a realistic depiction, that's interesting. Like, um, it's about expressing like this object and how we do this as an observe. Now, what does this have to do with contact juggling? It's kind of like the question, like is, is contact juggling, or is it circus, or is it a skill, juggling is an art form, is it the combination of all of these? And there are different approaches and expressions uh, and influences with contact juggling, a different way of thinking about it. And I really want to start by kind of like defining what is the difference between an approach to something and what's an influence to something. And when we talk about influencing or an influence, it's kind of like the effect of a certain thing 
results in a changing of our behavior or character, our development, our expression, or even the effects of it itself. An approach is the way we look at something or looking at a situation, which is kind of an abstract way of saying it. But if we look at, uh, I've wrote, written down an abstract example, like we're looking at this wall um, and we can look at it from a different point of view, right? Like I can go sit down here on the floor and look at this wall and I see it in a certain way. I can stand up and look at it and see it in a certain way. This gives us a different perspective. This is our approach. Now, during different types of the day, a uh, different light hits this wall. And I observe this differently. Like the wall that I look at is, stays the same. But what I, uh, but the way how I see it, like it's influence. So the light is the influence that affects on how we see these things. And these things can be the same, uh, the same thing. So before I want to talk about major approaches and ways we can see contact juggling. I want to talk about uh, the inf what influences us in contact juggling and or not just us but what are a lot of big influences that we have here in, in contact juggling and we take influence from everywhere even without knowing uh, like the way you are brought up influences how you do things in your life. The way the thing that I've eaten just now will influence how I will juggle later on. Like if I just go to McDonald's and binge on like a bunch of burgers, my juggling is probably gonna be very slow. Well, if I had like a healthy meal, my juggling is gonna be uh, much more lighter and energetic. So when we talk about uh, influence, we decided to talk a little bit about uh, the influence that comes from within the circus community itself and influences that we draw from outside of the circus slash juggling community. Um, so, well, I am not reading the chats at the moment because I'm also looking at the notes. So I'm just going to continue. Uh, but if there's something uh, urgent come up, there's a raise the hand button, I think. So you, you can just use that. And, we can uh, unmute and just talk and interject. That's totally yeah. That's also yeah, totally fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're listening nice, nicely. Just it's it's offside. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, influences within uh, the circus community. There are of course all the other forms of juggling where we talk about toss juggling or maybe we talk about staff spinning. Like it. These are all things that uh, no matter what, uh, we do, like we are aware of these and these could influence our contact juggling and our styles in that. Um, then there is the more of the theater and character based clowning, uh, type aspect where the influence is because of character building where we impersonate a type or we become a certain personality and through that we express ourselves in uh, in what we do in our art form now if you look a bit further than outside this juggling circus theater community everything could be our influence and one of the main influences that we uh, observe in most people are martial arts yoga and dance are kind of like the uh, main three things that we see in contact juggling when we talk about yoga we see a very meditative uh focus we see a lot of like balance and a very holistic and self expressionist approach and is there, is there anyone in particular you think about with a yoga background just to imagine oh uh, uh yeah i Please forgot this name unmute yourself if you want to speak just jump in alice if you want to speak unmute yourself oh. <laughs> <laughs> she's raising her hand and she's like that understood. Uh, it just misunderstood sorry <laughs> no that's no, no don't worry about it um yeah so I, 
no ex uh, specific examples. I just forgot their name. But there's a, for instance, there's one guy that does these incredible uh, balances, uh, head balances while meditating, even like double ball on head. That's Maybe Ed knows this. His name is Jotty, and he's been yes, yes, yeah. Jotty. That was it, exactly. Thank you, Ed. Um, but also, uh, one thing that is very a large influence from yoga is a natural build up in flow. Uh, most yoga classes that I have come to, or that other people that I know go to, they you start very basic and you build up to larger movements all until you get into your like your final peak pose so if you talk about contact let's maybe really first focus on these small arm rolls before we go to these bigger arm rolls until you eventually get into the really nice bigger uh, body or chest rolls like that whole build up is a very yoga type flow uh, approach but here is also where my yoga knowledge ends so <laughs> i like to continue to uh, more martial arts and we see a very different styles tai chi is one of them that's uh, very well uh, well done like we got the fan kim here who has a very large influence <laughs> in this tai chi base um, but there's also a lot of contact juggling that gets into the very like the rigidness of like a martial arts style, like the big movements, open hands, uh, which works very well. Like Calvin, for instance, even though he doesn't uh, doesn't talk about it a lot, but his style is very martial arts based. Like there's really big open movements. You see like the shift in their uh, their body weight. If I can throw in, sorry, in particular with Kelvin, um, one thing that stands out for me with him is he has this very unique style, which I kind of describe as it's hard, but it's not harsh. His, move, his movements are very precise and very strong, but they're not aggressive in their motion. There's this kind of softness just at the end that just takes that harshness off it. And it is that control. It's that kind of, yeah, very uh, martial arts kind of feel to it as well. So it, um, it's yeah, really kind of... funny that your description of Kelvin style is very much a description of Kelvin himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's a lo lovely person. The one thing I want to say is, and I think uh, uh, this is where a lot of flow arts gets that horse stance, where like every poi and every flow arts, yeah, you could stand up there, Tom. This this particular stance. Uh, is a martial arts influence, I would say, whether we intend it or approach it that way ourselves or not. But this horse dance is so martial arts, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, it's the same as like uh, Kung Fu is, uh, it's kind of like, I feel like a Tai Chi is a very specific uh, in their, in the way of movement and the way of uh, constant breathing exercise, the repeats of it, that flows very uh, specific and recognizable in some forms of contact juggling. But whether you talk about karate, kung fu, jiu-jitsu, like all the movement that comes from that uh, looks rather similar. Again, we well, need yeah, to... Yeah, classifying proceed. a whole genre of martial arts into one thing, I'm sure the martial artists wouldn't totally agree with that. Like we don't put all of contact juggling into one thing. Uh, or no, even it's like saying, dance. <laughs> yeah, or circus. It's like saying circus influences this. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, but we do need to have quite some gross generalization just to wrap our head around where we're going to go later with all the approaches. Um, and another stuff that is a huge influence, uh, as I said earlier, is dance. And dance from all forms somehow makes it into contact juggling like i've seen really great examples of where uh janina mr om did a duo piece that had more of like a a tango thing where there's this constant of ball passing around while being in, in connection with each other i have no idea where that video went this was like 12 13 years ago <laughs> we've been in this for long 
Um, but within dance, there are certain topics that are, or certain styles that are stronger than others, like uh, Buto as an expressionist uh, Japanese style uh, dances there. Uh, we have contemporary, which I lean very much towards to these days, but there are also more funky styles where we talk about waving, popping, or any liquid style. So I kind of want to ask to go to Don. Do you want to see the video? Uh, yeah, so I really want to show, uh, let's go into liquid first, if possible. We're going, okay. LCD. LCD. Come on, computer work. Let's go. So the very liquid style that uh, Nick has here, like that influences the way he uh, contact juggles is a really interesting dance approach. And you see that there's a lot of like dance training happens separately to, to get to this point. Very popular. Uh, yeah, I know they will never go away. Like once this started, this is, is this is here to stay. The isolation approach. We've mentioned this in a couple of videos. You, you see beginners now are much more likely to throw in beginning thinkings about how we can move this ball in space and like, yeah, have this kind of ideas of these sort of fixed points that can be utilized in this kind of illusion that comes out of it. It's, um, it was a brand new thing and then it just became part of the sort of accepted repertoire, even if it's just kind of watching and imitating, which for a lot of beginners, that's kind of where it comes from. It's like, oh, I see people doing this and it looks interesting, but you kind of, there's a lot of unpicking to be done to make that work, to make that hit. But yeah, it's definitely kind of in the, in the norm now, in the, the dialogue, definitely for sure. Yeah, and like another example, uh, if Don could show the Zuska video, is of contemporary uh, dance and contact juggling, where, I mean, the video kind of like speaks for it, uh, itself. So this video is not very widely viewed. Uh, it's of our friend says that developed this amazing uh, style of contemporary dance, uh, but with a ball, like, with contact juggling. The way of movement uh, comes together as one piece. It's not, we do something with a ball and we do something while we dance. It's just as the liquid style. It's one thing creating a whole new uh, sets of movement. Lots of body rolling and uh, moving around and floor work is involved in this. But you see, completely different dance style to create a What's the link for this video? I know. Yeah, Dawn, can you just shrink it down so we can see the title? Yeah, let me see. Oh. There we are. Yeah, this is an incredible video. Um, you might be touching on this in a second, Robert, but um, just thinking a little bit about how the influences that we bring to this, kind of our, whether they're innate, whether they're things we've um, already experienced, already have kind of, um, yeah, we already have experience with that informs our contact in that those influences have their own kind of intentions or purposes. So to take, say, spinning, for example, whether it's staff, whether it's poi, whether it's bugeng, any of these kind of things, if you come into contact with a deep grounding in spinning of, of anything, your approach to contact is more likely to be informed by that. You're going to be looking for geometrical patterns if you're doing multi-ball, you're going to be making anti-spin shapes and those isolation shapes that you would have. Um, Dawn, I know you were very much like influenced with the, the different butterfly shapes and the two. That is a very spinning, like that idea comes out of those, those Vulcan ideas of making geometric shapes and moving them around. Um, and it kind of, yeah, so this stuff comes across. If you're coming in from a a popping or an, like animation styles of dance, you're gonna be trying to replicate things with the ball. Whether it is that kind of waviness that you want, or whether it's more of a physicality that it's like a robotic automaton kind of thing, um, that you're trying to 
replicate something that exists in the real world. I remember, Ed, you were talking about being influenced by like looking at swarm patterns and things of, of fish and birds and, and that kind of idea, trying to replicate those naturally occurring things through contact. So these influences, it's stuff which you kind of innately understand that you're then, we talked about this as a lens, like this is kind of the heading on the, the little advert for this, that contact being where all of this stuff funnels in, funnels in, funnels in, and it becomes the way that we view everything. Like this is one of the approaches. Um, yeah, talking about like the idea of contact as this top-down approach. We're not talking about all the little minuscule details. We're looking kind of how all of this stuff, all the stuff in the world can be like narrowed down to a point, just like how all the light is narrowed down through an acrylic to this specific point, all our kind of background thinking um, and how our influences really like feed into that. Um, but yeah, about, like fire back over to you there, Robert. No, yeah, no, totally. Like what Ben just said, like, oh, sorry, Don, please. I need to unmute myself. Uh, where does graphic manipulation fit in this? Like, this is the category of our of our whole thing. And also, like, is graphic manipulation an approach? Is it in the spinning approach? Or where does it fall? Like, P well, thing is really what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get to this when we okay. uh, get a little bit further into uh, at the end of the dance segment. Uh, but yeah, it is what Tom says. Like, your collective experiences will influence where you are and how you express yourself at this stage of your life. And this changes tomorrow, this changes next week, this changes next month. Like you are, the way you express yourself today is not the way you express yourself five years ago because all your influences changed as well. Uh, one quick other thing that I wanted to talk about, which is a huge influence or a huge is a big influence in contact juggling about the dance topic is uh, Buta. The, it's a Japanese theater performance style. And I find it really hard to explain specifically uh, what uh, can be, uh, what is Buta and what it can uh, be as created but it's a very uh, deep internal expression of dance and it there's a whole philosophy uh behind it and it comes from a uh sorry robert um a lot of the french ed, ed is uh raising ed, his hand there ed might know more about this um buto when it was kind of explained to me it was explained from um a perspective of you take this feeling that you have right now and you keep that feeling and then you move it over here and then you change it you have the same feeling but you change the way it looks but it's still the same and it's all about taking this internal feeling and manipulating that and changing the way that it looks from the outside and it can be incredibly intense and in incredibly emotional and it's amazing to watch i think what, there's an interesting thing with buto where people in particular focus on often very negative emotions to it because it's it's a very it really trucks in the extreme like spectrum of emotions but it's often very um yeah, that kind of angst, that pain, that anger, that sadness. But it does cut both ways as well. And it can be like extremes of joy and love and things as well. It's, um, it's really, yeah, it really is that taking very emotional core things and having that as your focus, having that as being the kind of what brings the dance to life. If you've ever seen The Ring or The Grudge, a lot of the movements from the the evil things in those movies, that's Buto. Yeah, it's like a raw emotional expression of that anger and yeah. fear. And like yeah. that's as the driving force behind your movement. And you can see like there's nice examples of that cutting into other styles. Um, Storyboard P, who's um, has this kind of mutation style of dance. And this, so he can do very kind of classic gliding, waving, all of this kind of stuff. And it looks really good. But then when he goes into this mutation style, it's this really deep, he becomes 
this monster that and that's what informs what he's doing and it's just it it feels so much weightier it feels so much heavier go on ed i i think you're you're putting quite a reductionist thing on that mutation style um Mutation for him, it's um, an amalgamation of everything all coming together and mutating into this raw form that is him. So everything he does, he can call it mutation style. Just as in when I was trying to describe my own style, I described it as, as fractal because it took a bit of everything. It was all the same thing, but it all came together and made something really complex and beautiful. Yeah, I... Unpacking that fractal stuff, like um, that would be really good for a discussion possibly next week when we talk about isolation stuff because um, there's a huge, huge amount to take from that. And that's like, if we're talking now about approaches and influences, when we kind of roll up this stuff uh, after Robert's kind of gone through his sort of side, I would love to talk some more about that because yeah, that's that's a huge side of, of these approaches. But um Yes, so Robert, go on. We were ch talking Buto. Well, it's kind of like uh, Seth read this, this um, extreme form of emotional expression. To really butcher it and summarize it, just for the sake of saying like, hey, this is something where we uh, get uh, influenced by. Because what I really want to talk about uh, today is, I don't know, we're half an hour in, is the approaches that people have to contact juggling like the and people have multiple approaches like it's not like you know we follow one religion and we stick by it you know and we do not look at those people we're not looking at those people um but what approach is, uh, do people have to contact juggling and sometimes it's very hard to define but we see a uh, few things that we see, we see is, uh, a very technical approach. And um, we talked about, uh, before this all started, we talked also a bit about like, what's a realism approach to contact juggling. But let's say, uh, if you take a technical approach for contact juggling, it's basically that the basis of most of your juggling that you do and that you train and the way you perceive your style of contact juggling is very technique based where you're like, okay, I'm doing a trick. You know, it's like, I'm gonna roll to this, this point, gonna store, and I'm gonna train this like nonstop. It's like, this is my trick. I'm gonna name this trick, and I'm gonna do this trick. We go one, two, three. This whole idea of when I'm gonna do a routine, I'm gonna do a routine where, okay, I'm gonna roll to my wrist, I'm gonna roll to my other wrist, I'm gonna pick the ball put it on my elbows. This is a very uh, structured way of thinking and looking at it, uh, just thinking about all these techniques that we uh, can do. So it's a technical approach. And this comes uh, from a lot of sports juggling, uh, where you see a lot of people just juggling numbers, where there's, uh, you start with the cascade, and after that, you know, do not call it the cascade, you're gonna call it the three, 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 which makes no sense. but we're going to talk about tight swap and we're going to talk about uh, doing everything very statically uh, maybe so technical approach to juggling a very uh, to contact juggling it's a very you know, useful uh, approach especially if you if you start learning a large technical base it's a uh, it's very heavy you see uh, an opposite approach that uh, I see is this the flow arts or yeah flow <laughs> I find it uh, sometimes a bit difficult to to talk about Don did you want to say something I just want to know do you want me to show a video of technical before we do we want to go through that or no yeah yeah let's show a video of technical if you got is that is that uh, JCJC that's what we're talking about the, I think that's uh, it that's a good example work. there Yanazo, this is Yanazo from 2012. Yeah, technical approach to contact juggling. Amazing skill level. I think when we talk about approaches, it's, it is that what is the desired, what is the thing that's making this beautiful or interesting for the, 
technical juggling side. It is technical complexity and execution at a high level. So you think about the perfect form. What does the perfect chest roll look like? If I'm stalling, is my entire body still? All this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, from a technical point of view, that's what we. That's kind of the the desired outcome. That's the intention of all this of this approach. The intention is we are going to do complicated roles. Um, and yeah, the more complicated, the better. Again, you talk about numbers juggling being a very good example of this because there's a beauty in it, but it's more about, when we talk about the beauty of numbers juggling, the difference between seven and nine in a cascade isn't actually that large. If you ask a lay audience, if you show them a seven ball juggler and a nine ball juggler side by side, they're not going to be able to count. They're not going to be able to know off the top of their head that, oh, one of these is, takes years more practice than the other one. Um, but for a technical sports juggling community, they can see that there's a beauty in that complexity in pushing those boundaries. Um, yeah, of like that kind of human achievement. Um, this just fired off my brain, but Dawn, this was a conversation that we had about, um, I think maybe Stefan brought this up about contemporary circus and uh, that um, classical circus was kind of human achievement against nature. Oh, there's a really good article that I could post later if I could find it again, but Stefan Singh uh, shared it online about, and, and I think I shared it with you, and it's, um, it's about how circus generally is, uh, the, like, is, a, is a representation of modernism as its form because it is like triumph over nature. It's our absolute strength and power shown. We are gods. We are in control. And circus is a really good example of that coming up in the 1800s to share that. And as we've gone into sort of more contemporary, sort of rejecting our traditional styles in circus of uh, here's a trick, here's a trick, here's a trick, that we um, are actually failing because we as circus performers are technicians and we can't seem to get into sort of a contemporary way of expressing ourselves without the technique getting in the way of our theater, of our dance, of our other ideas. And these are um, like circus on whole hasn't actually achieved anything past technicians yet. Which yeah. I think um, ties we'll into Robert. About. Yeah, exactly. This ties directly into what I think you're going on to now. Well, not just, I was, we still need to talk a little yeah, bit go, about go, go. flow at least. Um, so uh, another huge thing that is not technical is flow arts approach or where people really go into like, what is flow? Uh, so the flow state, I thought, uh, I'm just going to quote Ed because he's here in this meeting room, uh, in the Zoom meeting anyway. <laughs> Um, the flow state is basically anything that you do with a uh, kind of like your full attention span, like, but it also comes from a sort of like a automatic approach. And Ed was saying last week, you know, you can make a sandwich while being in the flow state. It doesn't have to be juggling. You can just go to your kitchen in the morning, just like completely in the zone, auto mode, plate sandwich, you know, peanut butter, I don't know, jelly if you're American and then that's uh that's a certain state so flow state and flow juggling is not the same just wanted to put that out there uh when people talk about that they're flow artists or they're they're part of that certain group they they do try you try to reach that certain states where you are are basically in the zone living in the moment uh mindful of what you're doing, uh, those are all just description factors of it. So, but a lot of this, there, it's more a little bit more emotional driven. Like it's about feeling good, or feeling that you're in the zone. And you can also draw from it of a more negative emotion. But I tend to not see people do that. Um, and kind of in between, we I want to talk about a spinning approach. So a spinning approaches that we see it is, is heavily based from other uh, spinning objects. And I'm talking about other props that have sort of a rotational movement 
then you look at this not from I'm um, making these circles, but you picture that you live in a sort of three-dimensional grid. The sa same as you, uh, what uh, Don just said, like graphic manipulation, like we are in this grid and like the way we combine these points to create diamond shapes or maybe square shapes, like how that works in an anti-spin. Those, uh, this is a very geometrical way of thinking and a way of seeing contact juggling, uh, which is a great approach and also great mental approach. This works really great with multiple. Let me, I only have silicon balls here, but all these ways uh, this moves together, like I'm just having four points in my hand that I spin. It's not much, but it's, this seeing this pattern and seeing that idea in my head and how this moves and i think tom is much better at doing multiple uh than um, I. of course i have nothing near me either but yeah that's um taking the idea of like uh peach was like super influential on this when he just put out an anti-spin multiball video one day and everyone was like oh my god you can do all yeah. this stuff because you think about the two, um, say just in a two ball, you think of it as the two ends of a staff that are, so all of those staff patterns we can recreate. Um, I'm not alone in this, but I've been trying to work like multi-ball as in palm spinning into a vertical plane so that we can really show off all of these beautiful anti-spin isolation shapes that are influenced by like spinning geometry, poi and staff spinning geometry, putting those into multiball, but actually displaying them to an audience. But um, yeah, all of those same ideas of, yeah, like how, how one isolates, how one anti-spins. And when you start putting that all stuff, putting all of that together, the geometrical possibilities are just crazy. Like it, it just explodes in complexity. This is hard to not do this without, like, without <laughs> having acrylics. Because the balls we, nah, we all understand what anti-spin means, don't we? Just making sure. It's well worth, yeah, <laughs> worth um, drawing on. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> again, I'm just going to show this with the uh, the vertical again here. Um, yeah, so we have these two objects. Or I'm kind of thinking of this as a single object as well, and really trying to think of. And when I've got four trying to think of that as one signal object as well that I can manipulate, like a shape that I can manipulate. But um, we're taking that spin, and if we move in the same direction of the spin, we get that isolation. So we're moving around. So one of these points appears to be like staying in one spot. But then if we go in the opposite way, so say I'm spinning anti-clockwise and then I move clockwise, we start to get these different patterns that form. Um, you see there's a lot of people like, um, a lot of like Facebook social media stuff now, people post little like diagrams of dots that move up and down, and then it looks like the whole thing's spinning. Um, all of these like classic geometric um, optical illusions are kind of coming back like that. Um, but we can take those optical illusions and play with them. Um, you think about Boogang, how Boogang turn against each other and create these kind of warping shapes is really reminiscent of very classical optical illusions. They're like super popular in kind of Victorian times and things, like these moiré patterns. Like my kind of shirt makes these like shifting shapes as I move around. Um, these, you have like stripes that move against each other and create illusions as they go and how we can play with that and change it around. Um, yeah, all these different illusions, like classical illusions can be applied to multiple as well. Again, we bring influences in from all over the damn place. Um, that was probably a digression because I started talking and now I realize I'm still talking. So I'm going to throw it back to Robert. No, 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 no. Don't, don't apologize because I feel like I'm going on for, <laughs> for quite a while here. Um, but yeah, a very spinning approach, a very uh, shape-based geometric uh, approach where it's really about visualizing how these things look into a three-dimensional plane. Uh, another approach, which kind of comes back as well, because we already talked about this in uh, influence, is dance. And, and you can say, like, hey, okay, why are we talking about dance again? We just had it with influence. But there's 
kind of like the difference between having dance as an approach to contact juggling or dance as an influence to contact juggling is where if we see dance as an, an influence, contact juggling is our main thing. The dance is secondary. Where if you talk about coming from a dance background, and it's like, I'm a dancer and I want to go contact juggling. Dancing is my main way of seeing how I'm contact juggling. So I will always uh, view dance as the most important thing. A very clear example of this, if you take your balls and you go to a rave party and you don't think about your juggling, you're just there and you have your props in your hand and you're just dancing around. And maybe occasionally, you know, there's, it goes into that isolation thing or maybe you're just like, yeah, you know, just playing around doing that thing. But the dance that becomes the more important aspect, whether the contact of me is just like a small, uh, tiny thing. So this is dance as an approach. Could be any type of dance. Like I just use Rave Party as, a, as an example because it's very uh, relatable into just going with it. But I've seen ballet dancers picking up contact juggling and their style is ballet. Like I will not, it's contact juggling, but it's also ballet. Have, have you I, seen uh, the Gandinis um, four by four with the ba ballet dancers and the jugglers? Um, I have a really nice article written about this, but like trying to watch the ballet dancers merge into juggling, uh, they just can't not be ballet dancers. It's really impossible for them, in my opinion. They, they can't, and the jugglers, they start to do ballet, but, and as the Gendinis grow together with them, they start to merge more. When I saw them at the Rencontre de Jonglage, I think 2016, they didn't merge at all. But then I saw them again and they began to merge together. And it's very interesting. Yeah, this is a very uh, clear example, actually, how two different approaches influences each other. You know, see we terminology approach influence, which sometimes it just feels like they're exactly the same thing. And sometimes they're completely not uh, the same thing. Um, so yeah, with approaches, we talked about these four uh, four things most uh, mostly observed is a technical or flow approach, a spinning approach, and a, a, a dance approach. Uh, for the people that are based in the US and uh, Canada, uh, Thai Foods is, has been touring for a while doing this, uh, promoting his like prop dance culture idea where he talks about dancing with their with your props and uh, he's a very uh, great guy, great teacher, great poi spinner, uh, and has a lot of great workshops. Like if you ever get the chance to follow him, has interesting uh, ideas about this as well. But let's talk about a little bit more of a different approach to contact juggling, and this is more in line with my approach, and it's more of an expressionistic uh, way of contact juggling. And this is also why I started very early on, where I talked about what is considered expressionism in art, where we uh, where it's just it's not anymore about what uh, you know. I'm doing this trick, or I'm doing a sequence of movement. It's about uh, what is my perception? How do I how do I feel, and how do I want to express that? So more of an expressionistic approach. Uh, which I find sometimes a bit hard to, uh, to explain. So I'm just talking about what I'm doing because <laughs> that makes it a bit easier. So in order, everything that you do as part of expression builds upon the knowledge that you previously have acquired. So what this means is that how uh, we said, like everything that has influenced you has made you to the person that you are. Um, if you train dance for 15 years, that is part of your uh, subconscious expression. Like it's in your body, like your mind knows this, your body knows this. If you can bike really well, you know, you're by, you get on a bike and you can do it. If I learn a lot of basic tricks in juggling, no matter what I do, without thinking about it, I can draw upon that information when I want to express myself. So this 
understanding of uh, and like having a knowledge base that you can build up on combined with awareness of your body like how does your body move how does it move in direction uh, or in relation to ship to space and then the third thing so is the mind uh, how do we perceive things how uh, to be honest with yourself like how does this ping ball make me feel or maybe not like how does this ping ball make me feel but you know when i walked out to 7-eleven to get a drink and i'm like people weren't social distancing like that made me feel maybe violated or in close form and acknowledging that feeling and then being able to say okay if this is what i feel how does how can i how do i respond to it and to not think about that response to let that all happen from a subconscious moment of expression and i mean and now we can talk about like is that then still contact juggling do we need to have this ball to do this no we don't this is where it, clown comes in a lot though like that that's a lot of the basis of clown and uh the 30 day challenge i did last year or oh my god it feels like last year uh two months ago and um how like actually expressing the feeling that you have out into a ball is 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 totally different like actually learning how to stop like from about two you start really suppressing all of your emotions and so like how to like actually open that up and express it and learn that channel and then put it into the ball is a lot about the approach of clown and uh theater and that sort of aspect and what i've been learning in at least in my pachinko style clowning there's different versions but that's one of the ways i think that that, I that think, helps you too. i kind of um yeah i i think that's there's things which in these approaches get pushed to the fore more often than others like um as you're saying robert like you have this technical grounding and then everything else is coming out on top of that so like dawn is saying emotion that's something that's forgotten so often in contact and we end up in this very kind of unexpressive form of contact which is about technical skill rather than personality exactly it's very serious it's very focused which um yeah like it's such an intrinsic part of us but it's something that gets put on the side in favor of the technical um a couple of things out of what you're saying robert it's like if you think about great abstract visual artists like fine art like you can see a sketch like the briefest sketch from late era picasso and how much expression there is. There's such economy of line, but that's so expressive. You only get that if you have an incredible grounding of the rules and the basis of fine art in kind of our Western tradition. Like you need to understand all of that technical, not, I mean, I say rules, but all of these kind of guidelines, all these things that we understand make up kind of fine art like that um yeah you, you need that kind of background to really be able to take this expression and just make it so effortless to make it kind of off the cuff in that same way it's uh, you can't jump straight into that Can, is it is is what you're saying like you'd have to learn sort of the yanizo technical stuff before you can express in other ways like you don't have to be that technical in his you know he's very technical but like you, if you learn your five tricks technically well that will help your expression um well i'll i'll sorry i'll throw i just like real quickly because just a little bit of this for, from my point of view i'm not saying i'm talking about kind of an extreme end there that's kind of a level of mastery um but i would also say if you learn if you teach yourself how to confidently draw a straight line in the circle you are then better equipped to sketch anything um, because you're not thinking about the actual technical side, you're thinking about just expressing yourself. Those are the kind of tools I'm talking about. Um, yeah, like, like sharpening those tools, like having that basis, that strong base that then informs that stuff. 
Yeah, I do really like what uh, Scott just put in the chat. It's where he said, uh, like a language metaphor is that you do not need uh, rules or guidelines uh, necessarily, but you need a uh, vocabulary and uh, fluency. Like you need to, to know what you're talking about or know what you're talking about. You need to have all the words available. Like for me, like English is not my... Sorry, um, uh, Ed? <laughs> Oh, um, I know uh, that's a great example. Like the language thing is um, definitely it's a it's a metaphor that I use a whole lot when I'm teaching as well, um, and I can see it in when I'm watching people, people who have like in videos and things, people who have who maybe just have the vocabulary without the fluency as well, and that's really easy to notice. Like they've picked up bits from here and there but they haven't then spent that time working out how to make that into a language, how to make that into something expressive. And it feels like, yeah, it, it feels like second language learning or even first, like, like first language learning and second language learning being very different. But yeah, it really feels like, okay, we're taking the bits that we understand and we're trying to make them fit. And that's, I mean, fluency comes from that. So yeah, but, um, no, that's a, that's a super good example. So yeah, Robert, you can cr you crack on. Uh, okay, so I'm quickly going to spy uh, to my notes. So I I talked about like having this uh, my approach of contact learning is where we have a a technical base which I can draw upon without thinking, um, having understanding of my body and having understanding of my mind and my emotional state. Uh, realizing what things do to me, how I react to something. Um, and of course, I can also tap into this uh, willingly, like literally forcing yourself to be angry, forcing yourself to be sad uh, if you want to. Cannot recommend it. It works better with strong emotions. Uh, but it does create a very powerful form of expression. Now, uh, combined uh these anything all the impulses that we have on a daily basis like it's these subconscious observations uh we can like translate into these into movements but without being predetermined uh but still then based on the with the full potential of all the skills and knowledge that we have uh, previously acquired uh, which is obviously is not just contact juggling what we talk about contact juggling because Contact juggling is just plain awesome. <laughs> and it's our lens. It's the lens through which we see this stuff. Yeah. Um, so it leads to a certain amount of uh, improvisation. Uh, and later, I, I, later on, I can say like, hey, this is really good what came out of this why don't I just use this? And this, that becomes my new technique, my new normal. Uh, and for me, like dance really helped uh, express a lot of these things into it, but also uh, bringing on like, you know, being depressed or having certain ideas or experiences in your life that's uh, aided in that expression, changed your style. Uh, so yeah, when we, I talk about a more expressionist style of contact juggling is really to create from your subconsciousness. Uh, I mean, there's no, it doesn't really get deeper into it. Uh, I can also show you other types of art, but that is also purely expression, but it's not, it's not contact juggling. But yeah, like, please, I mean, I've been talking, we've been talking for like nearly an hour, so we should really, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, yeah, are you opening this up? Does anybody have any any comments or anything that like this has been um, the Robert show today, which is great. I'm really enjoying this super philosophical point of view. <laughs> um, I just like before like throwing out because I definitely will go around and like because um, I want to get some feedback on this. Um, I think to like to throw some summing up kind of ideas at that. Um, but yeah, so we have these kind of different approaches at play, um, very structured approaches, very free approaches. But what we actually find is that 
we need to find the balance of these things. So these things are kind of in, not in conflict, I mean, they feel like they're in conflict with each other. Um, to get like a little deep on it a little bit, um, in a Western culture like ours, we tend to favor very structured approaches. Um, in terms of like general media and things like that, there's generally um, a celebration of uh, very technically, structurally organized um, art and things like that, very realist things. So there tends to be a kind of a populist pushback against things which are chaotic. You see people commenting things like on modern art, like, oh, my child could do that, or, oh, that's so simple. Um, people, yeah, so people tend to really respect that process of, oh, well, this person train they must have trained really hard they can perfectly paint something from life or their dance is so precise and so clean and so quick that's what in our western society we tend towards um and then the chaotic side is kind of squashed down like it's seen as almost a guilty pleasure in some way or something that's not as desirable and we see this with the flow arts thing like there was a pushback in the technical community to say, well, flow arts is, it's somehow less. There's a hierarchy here. We're going to like put this at arm's length because it's not what we do, like in the technical side. Um, that's really indicative of kind of a more general view of art that goes around that we're going to respond much more positively to something that we can see the time and the effort has gone into rather than something which is more rawly expressive and emotional people who can break through by being expressive and emotional and creative are seen in some way as iconoclasts or like these kind of very special subjects to be observed and kind of preserved you see it with like tracy emin becoming a big thing in the modern art scene is like okay. go on the sorry what you're looking for is pretentious yeah, well, I don't even know if it's pretension, because pretension, um, I don't know if, if that is what I mean, because the idea that we're rewarding someone for the work that they've put in, it feels like a very capitalist view of um, art. It's that, like, well, you've put the time in, you've put the work in, you've learned how to do this thing, like, from a juggling point of view. Oh, it's like, you've learned how to juggle five balls, you must be a juggler. Whereas someone who's doing a very artistic, very movement-based three ball, or a flow artist who's not necessarily doing anything technical, but is kind of expressing themselves emotionally, that's in some way lesser. Um, I, I mean, that's just kind of tying it into our, I, like... I have two on, things here. Culturally speaking, there's so many things at play that I can't um, stop. One is that... Uh, North America's philosophy has a very right and wrong um, point of view. There's some studies about people who learn math in Japan versus um, the U.S. And people in the U.S. have like an a inborn talent. Like there's a, a point of view that you are either good at math or you're not. And so there's this gender disparity between uh, men and women in the U.S. But that doesn't exist in Japan because in Japan, the belief is just that math comes from hard work and that anybody can do it. And so there's no gender disparity. And this is one of the, the results of having this um, you're wrong kind of thing. And the other thing is in Europe, um, because art has been so influential, it's something that is taught in schools uh, really young. It's something that is valued and shown to young children as a as an example. Um, whereas in, as a North American person, like like you know, Darkwing Duck was my main influence as a child <laughs> and like not pick, like these, these paintings, I, I didn't get to see them until 2006, two years after I'd learned contact juggling and went to Europe for contact juggling. Well, I like to, like to bring something out of that, which is, I kind of think speaks volumes, is that we're taught art much more than in general, much more than we actually have um, interaction with art is our kind of interaction with how it's taught. And the fact that you can fail art in some way, that there is a right and a wrong, and that the way to succeed, the way to get a, a passing grade is to obey these kind of rules. Like, what it means is it creates this division, but 
you can't survive off that. We, we need this push and pull of both sides. Whatever it is that influences us, we need both sides kind of playing together. Like these aren't, this isn't a monolith. We're not talking about monoliths. We really want, as a Western culture, again, we really want to make this A and B, X and Y. Um, but that's just not how our brains are wired. Like we're rebelling against that all the time. That's where cognitive dissonance comes from. It's because like, it's not a human thing to say that this is right and this is wrong. Um, and yeah, we need to find those two balances. Um, that's kind of very philosophical way, but I would love to kind of, yeah, to, to go around a little bit and just to hear from people, yeah, about what influences them and like what approaches, like what their influences are versus what their approaches are. What did they come into contact with? And then what have they tried to push their contact through? Um, does anyone feel like they've got something they want to, uh, to throw into this? Because we've been talking for a little while. Yeah, sorry, we've been we've been like normally this is kind of community. We're trying kind of a new format by introducing new hosts today. So, um, does anybody have anything? Any questions about anything that was said today? Anyone? No. I mean, it is a, a very lot of information that we literally just like <laughs> grab and just throw at you, and like these are ideas and things that we. We think about for years, we talk about with our friends, we talk about with other artists. Uh, so for us, it's a very clear picture and we try to sort of distill it into a format that <laughs> sort of becomes understandable. Um, but but yeah. We, if, yeah. Oh yeah, that was a hand up. Yeah, it's not, not so much questions as just some of the thoughts going through my head and so on with all of this. And, there's certainly as when when you start off there's so much focus on tech and it can be just so overwhelming you know i see still it's been i mean it's 10 years ago i started started doing this and i still consider myself a beginner and i see some of the some of the technical sort of body rolling some of the real some of the things that I still look at and there's a part of me that still goes, I'm not going to be able to do that. But I now go, actually, that's okay. It doesn't matter that I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, when I, when I perform magic at weddings and so on, I don't do my really technical things. I do 10 tricks that aren't necessarily difficult, but that I can do so well I don't think about them and I can perform rather than um, displaying skill and that's really what I came to I do practice some of the technical things I enjoy doing that but that's for me not for the people I'm performing to if you see what I mean that's so that it's it's the pleasure I get from it but when it's a performance you know just for the kids they just love it and it's not difficult well actually that's not true it it is difficult to make it look smooth and so on which that wasn't because i've got it sat down i've got a dog sniffing me net <laughs> um but i think one one of the things that you develop is learning that doing a small number of things well and smoothly is better than doing lots of things and, tr and not being able to put all that together into a performance. I, yeah, do, have you um, seen, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Lisa, go on. I would like to add something to you. Ed. Like, I think it's you that put it in the comments earlier is obviously when you put performance in it, uh, the audience become the most important aspect of, of what you're doing and everything you're doing is thought into catering for them and who they are and who they want not necessarily everything but that's what you're doing it for them if you're playing with yourself for yourself if you're uh, experimenting and, and 
uh, it's a whole because you are your own audience so now it's it's what it, that's why when we write text when we in high school the first thing we ask is who's your who's going to read your piece because who you're writing to is going to affect incredibly what you're writing and how you're writing it it's the same thing for performing if you do if you bring a performance approach which i'm really happy you did because so far it hasn't really been mentioned um right now everything you do is towards an audience and that is the most important thing you need to think about and it's going to change drastically depending who your audience is and what your intention is and that's why some pieces are going to be good at some events and you can't show that piece to another event because it's not suited. Um, and so that was uh, just to add to your point. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add that's for me is I started juggling and dancing at about the same time. And it took me probably five to seven, eight years to put them together. And I, because it was just personally wasn't natural for me. For me, it was not natural. I learned to dance and I learned the juggling and I've wanted to put them together, but it didn't work in my head and it didn't work in my body until I was good and comfortable enough with both to be able to put them together. And on my dance sides, if for those of you who are not, uh, don't know me i'm a i'm a belly dancer and already i'm not going into the belly dance debate because it's massive but american Amer americanized belly dance is completely messed up um <laughs> just to say it like that it's completely uh, everything exploded and we got uh, we got influence from everywhere and it got completely off the rail which is wonderful and created beautiful thing but we are fusion people because we fuse different style uh, de facto, like I start learning belly dancing in a fused style and I had to go back to get my roots uh, in a more classical style to understand what I was being taught in my fusion style. Um, and I was one of my teachers told me in the past, yes, it's fun to learn things and to go around and watch videos and find what other people are doing or see performance and getting bits from it. But you cannot fuse things if you do not understand each thing separately. And that's what it is. And when you put dancing or buto or martial art with your juggling, you do not have a good understanding. I don't mean you need to be technical or proficient or amazing at it, but you need to deeply understand it to be able to put them together efficiently. That's just what I want to say. Yeah. I've got another point coming on down here. Um, were you uh, bringing up a point there, Casey? Hey, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, so my only thing was just bringing back to the, the language analogy, you know, um, you, without the vocabulary, you know, you can't have that fluency. And so it feels like that's kind of what Lisa was just talking about, where, you know, it took a number of years building up a vocabulary of juggling moves, of dancing moves to the point that you felt that you could combine them in a way that is, you know, like having a conversation or like writing a unique piece of, you know, poetry or something like that. If you don't know the words and the, the context of, you know, the language, then you can't do those things. So it just was what I was thinking about. Yeah. I think a thing which it's so important to stress, which um, maybe isn't apparent, especially because the way that we interact with a lot of this media is we see kind of finished products uh, whether it's through Instagram or through YouTube, we kind of see end results rather than works in progress. Nobody gets good at a fusion if they don't dedicate themselves to both sides. Like, you're never going to be able to do a mix of contact and dance unless you put the ball down. You forget about the ball and you start again with dance or the other way around you put the dancing to one side and you pick up the ball and go, okay, what are the physics of this object? How does this work? You can't, I mean, you can put them together, but you're going to be missing that fluency. As we keep saying, like you really need to have that time dedicated to what you're fusing into it. Otherwise you are picking, you're just cherry picking the bits. 
which can be interesting and you can get good stuff out of that, but you're never going to have that same actual fusion. I'm just yeah, going to continue with that. And like, in, and the other thing is like, yes, you become proficient and understanding of each style to be able to put them together. But for me, in my personal experience, when I started putting them together, I was back at square zero. And it was a relearning entirely of everything. And when I said it, ta it took me five to seven years to start being able to put them together. It took me another three, four years to be able to it to start looking good. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's still probably just since last summer that I'm like, okay, I think I get it. But I mean, I get it. I'm not amazing at it, but I get it. It's starting to look like something. I'm eight years into clown and I think I'm starting to understand what I might be trying to do. I yeah. think like a really good thing to take away um, is so well for me at least for fusion stuff is look at look at the base level like simplify everything everything right the way back and see where the similarities are because that's where your fusion is going to come from so if you get really into waving and you realize that it's all about separating these different points then you realize that when you're rolling a ball, you're having control at each of those points as you roll around. You need to have that separation. It's exactly the same in between the two. Um, I think I mentioned this somewhere else before, but that arm wave, that one point after another until they can't move anymore, then everything moving in unison, those exercises that you learn, when you learn violin, and you're learning how to bow, you're actually doing, they actually teach you the same exercises. They say, oh, it's your, it's your shoulder, it's your elbow, it's your wrist, it's your fingers, and then everything pulling down in unison. So when we walk, it's essentially this one body wave that goes at the same time. The way your hip, your knee, your ankle, your toes, everything moves down. It's the same points of articulation as we get in the arm wave, but then it carries up through everything. So the first thing, like the first movement that we really kind of emphasize for kids to learn is walking and it's waving. So like when you start breaking things down to these tiny levels, you realize how that's what's going to influence everything. Um, and that's any approach. So like, yeah, if it's, um, if it was like the spinning, you would break it down into what are our simplest geometric shapes that we can make? How can I make these simplest geometric shapes with a prop? and with my body. Like, um, I pulled out waving there just because it's a nice example of everything, but um, any of these approaches, like good fusion comes from, okay, what are my tiny little building blocks that I can take out? I say tiny blocks, you can think of them as what are the huge fundamentals that guide everything of this? And how do they match up with contact as well? Like, where's the crossover? So having that, you know, good knowledge base that starts from, you know, you need to like walk before we can run. It's a very simple saying. Uh, that knowledge base before you can combine it, then yes, you're back to square one. Like, as Lisa said, like before, I do combine dance and contact juggling. For me, I, all, I really wanted to combine dance. And I started off with a lot of uh, hip hop imitation. And until the point where I was like, okay, I want to try contemporary, where I was literally taking every contemporary class that was available in, a, in an evening during the week for years. And now after maybe seven or eight years, I might not suck that much, you know? But this, where it gets, but throughout this entire journey, you're still expressing yourself. Because for expression, you don't need technique. Like you don't need to go to an art store and buy fancy art supplies to be a painter. And this is something that's very important that you need to realize. So no matter how good you are or how, you know, if, even if you just start it, as long as you're doing it and having fun, it's all that matters. Yeah. Um, I, re I think like um, the graphic manipulation, like that's why this is so important because that's what graphic manipulation kind of puts at the forefront um, is how important the, the look of the thing is rather than the technical difficulty. 
like it removes this idea of a hierarchy of technique. It's like, yes, and around the neck roll is very difficult and impressive in its difficulty, but does it look right at that moment or would a simple chest roll suffice? Or would just taking the ball and moving it have the same impact? It's like graphic manipulation, making an image for a spectator, it doesn't matter how difficult everything is going in, just that it makes an atmosphere, makes an image that you want to put across. But yeah, um, I'm sorry about that. Yay! And yeah, and I mean, like, I really come from that play place, and 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 what you said there, Robert, um, really exemplifies like my approach. Generally speaking, is like. I express myself where I'm at right now and I always really have and I'm really lucky that I I uh, feel free to do so because freeing yourself into that is, is, is difficult already um, and but if you can be free and just be like my expression counts my voice counts my way of being in this world right now I don't have to be technical I don't have to uh, make this absolutely perfect but um, I want this to express something and connect. Uh, if I'm sharing it on Instagram, for example, that I want it to connect with somebody to share, Hey, I'm having fun and this is fun. And that's really like, for me, contact juggling is fun. <laughs> and I want to share that, that expression. And hopefully people get that. Like hopefully my way of being in it shares that, you know? Yeah. And there's no wrong way of, doing art it's it's just not there like everything that you do every you are an artist you you are and uh, whether you draw a line as a kid like or you colored something or you haven't done anything in ages you are an artist like and it's always okay and everything you do is art with the exception of kendama Um, I think that might be a really wonderful place to wrap this up and just stop the recording. You guys are welcome to stay in this Zoom room and chat and juggle if you want. Um, and it'll continue on from here and you can say all your swear words and everything. Uh, but from this point on, I will say goodbye. And then I will hit the not recording. So thank you very just, much. Just before tying up, um, we're going to be back next week. Um, we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to do kind of a, a deep dive on isolation, um, and the concept and Kendama, um, and how the two relate to each other. Um, no, <laughs> no, I was distracted by the Kendama, it's a curse. Um, we're going to be talking about isolation and we're going to have some really interesting people talking about that. And, um, yeah, doing a deep dive not on, about how to process that stuff and different ways of processing it and what it can mean because it's a whole big important style and then after that we're going to be talking about multi-ball same thing like what makes good multi-ball how do you get into multi-ball how do you uh how do you express yourself through it and then rolling after that so we're gonna keep going um out in that direction um so yeah thank you everyone for being here and yeah like don said stick around as she said, you can use your, your swears. We'll go around the room and everyone can say all the swears they know. Yay, thank you so much. And the recording ends now.